Good afternoon. Today, we talk about the string bass in jazz. Which, uh, most people know that's part of the rhythm section. Uh, when the first jazz bands came on, uh, a lot of them didn't use the string bass, they used the tuba. They called it the brass bass. And they even made a brass bass, a bass that was made out of, uh, I think it was a moon or whatever. But uh, one of the first um, guys to bring the bass on the scene was a guy from New Orleans. His name was George Pops Forster. They called him Pops because they said every band he was in, he was the oldest guy in every band he participated in. Uh, he started playing around uh, New Orleans on the riverboats and came to New York and joined a um, a New Orleans uh, led band by Lewis Russell. This was a band made up comprised of mostly New Orleans musicians, and it was one of the top bands in New York in the 20s, 25, 26. Had Red Allen and a host of other. But Pops Russell was one of the first bass players. When he got to New York, most guys were playing tuba. And when they seen Pops Russell play the bass, they said, oh man, it's much easier to, to play the bass than play that tuba because listen to some of the early records and tuba player had to work, you know, all night he had to play the rhythm, boop, 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 through the whole song he had to keep that. So Pops Force, when he brought the bass in, everybody started switching from the tubas to the string bass. Uh, played with Louis Armstrong, played with all the cast, and then his later years, he came to California, he played in a group with Earl Watkins and uh, Earl Hines, they were over at the Hangover Club in San Francisco for years up to his death. He died here in San Francisco. But he was one of the pioneers of the string bass, mostly a two beat kind of feel, boom, 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 like that, you know, two beat. He's got Sylvester Walter Page. Uh, he was born in uh, Oklahoma. But um, started playing around Kansas City. Um, with, uh, noted by Walter Page, he was one of the first bass leaders. He had a, a group called Walter Page and his Blue Devils, uh, and he recorded one of the first uh, bass solos on '78. It was called Page and the Devil. <laughs> Walter Page. <laughs> you know, a lot of people thought that they were playing devil's music anyway. Mm. Uh, Guys, they couldn't let their folks know they were into jazz because, oh man, it was, that was horrific at that time. But music became world famous, that devil music that they call. Mm. But anyway, Walter Page, he had a group in um, Oklahoma City called the Blue Devils. He had uh, Lester Young, he had Hot Lips Page, he had Jimmy Rushing, he had Count Basie. This was the nucleus of the Count Basie band. And, um, Basie and Jimmy Rushing quit and went to Kansas City and started playing with Benny Moten's band. And Walter Page broke the band up and came to Kansas City and joined Benny Moten's band. And that band, when Benny Moten died, Count Basie took it over and they became the All American Rhythm Section with Walter Page, uh, Joe Jones, Freddie Green, and Count Basie. They had a, they brought in a new kind of um, style. Um, mainly to Walter Pages, he started was one of the first bass players to, to walk. Instead of two beat like boom, boom, he would like boom, 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 boom. He had that walking and made the music kind of take off. Uh, played with bass for many years and uh, uh, played around. Uh, he was on the Sound of Jazz. That was his, one of the last appearances. He was on uh, the TV show they had on. Uh, CBS Network in the 50s. This guy's name is John Kirby. He said he was born in Virginia, but he was raised in uh, Baltimore, Maryland. He was an orphan. Uh, started playing around in Baltimore, playing with Chick Webb. Uh, then he came to New York. He joined the Fletcher Henderson band as a tuba player. Uh, and I got quite a few records with uh, John Kirby playing tuba with Fletcher Anderson. He switched over to uh, string bass and uh, continued with uh, Lewis Russell, who played with uh, Earl Hines, different people in New York. And then around 1935, he formed his own 
uh, little bleak. They called it the, the swingest little band in the land. He had Charlie Chavis, Russell Procrum, Buster Bailey, and O'Neill Spencer, Billy Kyle. And this band it was like a little small sextet, but they played, they sounded like a big band, and what they did was incorporate classical tunes. They would play shooting, and they would swing it, you know, and they, they had all kinds of um, big time jobs at the Waldorf Astoria, and all kinds of places. Um, and then uh, he married Maxine Sullivan, a great singer. Around 1939, he married Maxine. They did uh, Lock Loman. Uh, you take the high road, you know how to take that tune, and they kind of made it swing and it became a big hit. And then um, he had a radio show um, on uh, nationwide uh, radio during the 1930s, John Kirby, also a bass leader. He was a leader of the bass. Uh, most of the time, um, most of the leaders are trumpet players or piano players, but it's the bass player, John Kirby. Now this guy right here, uh, I would consider him the greatest of all the bass players. His name is Jimmy Blanton, born in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, started playing the bass. Uh, he studied bass in Tennessee, Tennessee State. And, uh, started playing on the riverboats. Duke Ellington heard him. He was 20 years old, uh, and Duke got him in the band. I think 1939. Jimmy Blanton was dead in 1941, uh, 22 years old, he mm. died, but the stuff he did with the bass, uh, it was all the stuff that the modern cats are doing today, he was doing it, he was bowing solos, uh, pizzicato, him and Duke Ellington did a duet um, compilation in, uh, in Chicago when you're just piano and bass and Duke kind of featured him, uh, Jimmy Blanton, Body and Soul and all these sophisticated lady, different tunes. And um, he was so uh, influential that most people refer to Duke's band during that period as the Blanton-Webster band because he, Duke had Jimmy Blanton and Ben Webster at that time and Ivy Anderson, they did some of the most beautiful recordings during that period. Uh, Jimmy Blanton, like I said, uh, died at the age of about 22 years old with tuberculosis. But, uh, his influence was phenomenal. I mean, you could hear what he was doing on bass in the 30s, you'd say, oh, you know, he was just fun. so far ahead of all the other cats that was happening. This is a guy out of uh, Inglewood, New Jersey, named Slam Stewart. And Slam really, his, he put the fame on bass. Uh, when he was going to uh, Boston Conservatory, he met this violin player named Ray Perry, a black violin player. And Ray Perry would solo and hum a tune while he's soloing. And Slam Stewart got that idea of bowing the bass and humming it, an octave higher or, or whatever. And um, he just brought that style in. I remember first hearing Slam Stewart, my folks had these 78 records. It was just the sound that he had. It was, it was like not, not <laughs> it was, Comical in a sense, but it was like a novelty. But it was it was hip because you knew what he was doing was really hard to do. You know, uh, he played with Charlie Parker. Uh, one of his uh, first gigs was with the great Art Tatum. Art Tatum had a trio with Sam Stewart and Tiny Grimes on guitar, and um, and then he joined Slim Gaylord. They had a group called Slim and Slam, and they did Flatfoot Fuji. That was mm. a hit at that time. And, uh, Slam Stewart continued to play. Um, I think he was at um, one of the colleges, I don't know whether it was Yale. Yale University he was teaching at Yale until the time he died. And uh, I got a chance to see him at the Keystone Corner, him and Eleanor Jackett. They did a version of Round Midnight uh, with Slam Bowen and uh, Jack L on bass, bass clarinet. It was just beautiful. But uh, great influence on a lot of um, bass players. Yeah, this is uh, another master of the bass. Uh, came ar around the same time as Jimmy Blanton. Uh, he, he says that he never heard Jimmy Blanton, but he had the same ideas. His name was Oscar Pettigrew. He was born in uh, Okmulgee, Oklahoma. His mother, mother was Choctaw Indian, and his father was black and Cherokee. 
And uh, they had a, a big band, a family. Um, Doc Pettiford had a band, and they would travel all over the Midwest. And Oscar, uh, Milt Hinton heard Oscar when he was about 15 years old and told Oscar that he needed, when he get a raise, he needed to come to New York. So Oscar kind of gave up music until 1941, and Milt Hinton met him again, because Milt came through with the Cab Calloway band and told Oscar to come to New York. Pepper came to New York and instantly joined Charlie Barnett's band. He was one of the first to uh, integrate that band. Him and Howard McGee, they were with Charlie Barnett for a short period of time. And then he uh, opened up a band on 52nd Street. Him and Dizzy had one of the first bebop bands on 52nd Street. He joined Colin Hawkins, and uh, he's in a movie. At, uh, it's an old, old uh, black and white movie called The Crimson Canary. And if you ever see that movie, check it out, because it's a... Uh, it's about a four minute skit with um, Coleman Hawkins with his band and Josh Roy White, the, the folk guitar player. But just to set in with Coleman Hawkins and Oscar Pettiford and Howard McGee is just pretty bop. It's real hip. It's one of the hippest things I've seen uh, as jazz, presenting jazz on TV. Oscar Pettiford takes a solo, uh, just maybe 10 second solo, but the stuff he plays on it is just phenomenal. One of the, uh, like I said, one of my favorite bass players. Uh, continued uh, to play in New York. Uh, wrote some of the great tunes, uh, Blues in the Closet, Bohemian After Dark, and Swing to the Girls Come Home, Tricticism. These were some of the compositions he wrote. Uh, played with Duke for a while. And uh, then he formed his own band in New York City. Had some of the greatest uh, musicians, Art Farmer, Gigi Grice. Donald Byrd, all the cats playing with him. But Pettiford, um, at that time in the 50s, a lot of black musicians were just, uh, just fed up with the whole scene in America. Um, a lot of them started going to Europe. Um, and Pettiford was one. He went to Germany and stayed over there until he got in an accident, um, a car accident, and um, died from that um, in Germany. But um, one of, like I said, one of the Jimmy Bland was first and Pettiford's right there, right after him. Didn't he was a master of the cello. I forgot to mention that. He broke his arm while he was with Charlie Barnett. And uh, so he couldn't really hold a bass like that. So he started playing the cello and uh, he became the master of the jazz cello. I don't, I don't know if there's anybody who ever recorded it. Um, Ray Brown did it, and Percy Heath did it, Doug Watkins did it, but uh, Oscar Pettiford, uh, he had, his, his intonation on bass was perfect, you know, just perfect. And this is a guy who um, always tried to cut Oscar Pettiford. Uh, uh, Sonny Buxton talks about a, a time he came out, this is Charlie Mingus, out of Los Angeles, California. Um, started playing around Los Angeles with Lionel Hampton. Um, he did a recording with Ham called Mingus Fingers, um, which was another early uh, bass uh, solo um, on, on record, early 78s. Uh, he joined the Red Narbo band with um, Tower Farlow, Red Narbo band, but he didn't stay with them too long because he was having heat going into these big hotels and they were questioning why you have this Negro guy in the band and you know, you, you run into that. So Mingus uh, gave that up and he started debut records uh, around 1950. Him and Max Roach oh, uh, started a label called Debut Records. And, uh, they did one of the greatest live recordings. It's called Jazz at Massey Hall. Uh, they went to uh, a place in, it's still in Canada, Toronto. It's called Massey Hall. And they gave her a concert with Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, Bud Powell, Max Roach, and Charlie Mingus. And it was all the top cats that recorded this. And it's one of the greatest uh, live recordings ever, and Charlie Mingus had something to do with it. Uh, he continued, and then he, uh, Mingus was, uh, how can I say it, he was, he, his compositions were Duke Ellington-ish, and also church, gospel church. Uh, you better get it in your soul, and uh, hog, hog something blues, and uh, then he wrote one for Charlie Parker, if Charlie Parker was a gunslinger, there'd be a lot of dead copycats. <laughs> he was, he said Bird was that influential on so many musicians. And uh, whenever a musician uh, came with his group, 
to join this group, he would tell them, I don't want to hear Charlie Park, I want you to go, I want to hear you. When Jackie McLean first came, he said, I'm tired of hearing Bird, play Jackie McLean. So he was that kind of uh, leader. He would get all the altercations on the bandstand with some of his members, you know. He was, I seen him in person quite a few times, and he was just a character. I seen him just reach down and pick up somebody's drink and drink their drink. <laughs> <laughs> the cat wouldn't say nothing. Was there no workout on Bald Mania Stakes that just came out? Oh, okay. And then he has one called Beneath the Underdog. Yeah, that was his famous. first, yeah, that was his first book. Really. And uh, talks about me. It's, uh, it's, he was just was a, a way out cat, you know. Um, he also he had Eric Dolphy in the group, and they did um, a recording called "What Love." It was based on what is this thing called love? And it's just a duet with him and Eric Dolphy, bass and um, bass clarinet, and it's like these two guys are cussing each other out. <laughs> That's how the music. I mean, Eric. For your person who never heard of Eric Dolphy, he was one of the most vocal uh, musicians I ever heard. He could make the, his instrument sound like a, uh, somebody was screaming for help, you know. He, just, uh, he, could, he could really get it, get into your soul. So he, he played bass, clarinet, flute, and alto saxophone, uh, Eric Dolphy. But Mingus was one of the musicians who seen uh, different people, and, and when you got to Mingus, he made you change your concept of music. Mr. Ray Brown out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, played around Pittsburgh with Mary Lou Williams and different guys. And then he came to New York, uh, just decided to come to New York. He met Hank Jones the same day when he came to New York, and Hank introduced him to Dizzy. Dizzy Gillespie hired him right on the spot. And uh, he joined the Dizzy Band, um, which had John Lewis, uh, Kenny Clark, and Milk Jackson. And that that nucleus of that rhythm section broke away and formed the MJQ a few years later with Ray Brown. Ray Brown stayed with MJQ for a short period because he married Ella Fitzgerald and Ella started going on the road, so he joined Ella Fitzgerald's uh, band and Percy Heath took his place with the MJQ and that's Percy Heath did most of the recordings except uh, just a couple of early ones with Ray Brown. But uh, one of the great, uh, Kenny Clark says he's a, that's, the bass player he wants in the back of him when he plays. He said Ray Brown just had that that beat, you know, that constant. Uh, he would run over you too if you didn't know what you were doing. You know, the bass player would run. Paul Chambers would do that too. He called me. But um, great bass player um, died a few years ago uh, uh, and had a group with the LA Four with uh, Bud Shank and Shelly Man. They had a group at LA Four. Uh, Ray didn't really stay in New York. He kind of stayed on the West Coast. He was more, a lot of people thought he was a West Coast musician, but he could easily play with the cats on the East Coast, but he was, he was more comfortable living out here, which I found out in 1972. <laughs> 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 I came out here from Brooklyn at that freezing weather. And I, you know, so I see why a lot of cats came out here and stayed. You know. This is the guy who took uh, Ray Brown's place with MJQ. His name was Percy Heath. He was born in Wilmington, North Carolina, but uh, he was raised in Philadelphia. He was uh, the middle of three brothers. He had an older brother named Jimmy Heath, who's still living, and a younger brother named Tootie Heath. They were just at Stanford about two weeks ago at the Stanford Jazz Festival. They were called the Heath Brothers. They had a group called the Heath Brothers. But Percy, uh, he was a Tuskegee Airman. Uh, he was training for that. And one of his best friends got in the training, got in a uh, crash and got killed. His mother told him to get out of that. So he didn't stay in that. He got discharged from the army and came back to um, Philadelphia, went to school. He said his brother Jimmy pretty much showed him everything technically about music. And then he came to New York and joined Jimmy Heath with um, Dizzy Gillespie's band. Um, played around with Miles. He did some of the Miles' is greatest stuff on uh, walk in bags groove and uh, just uh, fine basically in terms of blues. I think he had one of the best sounding uh, basses on a blues number. This guy Percy Heath, uh, great, great bass player. This is Paul Lawrence Dunbar Chambers.
He was born in Pittsburgh, but he was raised in, uh, in Detroit. Went to Cass Tech. Uh, Cass Tech was a famous high school in Detroit that uh, a lot of me, Tom Bird, uh, Kenny Burrell, all the cats, Tommy Flanagan, all of them went to Cass Tech because they had a uh, great teacher there. You know, schools at that time, I was talking to somebody now, that's why they, a lot of our youngsters are so confused now because the music they're giving now is just, ooh, you put garbage in, you're going to get garbage out of it, you know? <laughs> and they don't have the chance. When I was in school, as soon as you got into the fourth grade, they would see what instrument you wanted to play. You know, I didn't, I didn't really take on the instrument because I thought that was sissy stuff at that time. I was into sports. And if you come home with a clarinet or a violin, somebody said, man, what are you doing? Nobody <laughs> getting a fight over that. You know? I think I'm weak. So uh, I didn't really take music up, but uh, Paul Chambers studied uh, classical. Um, I forgot what teacher he studied with. But uh, he, he's the closest thing to Jimmy Blanton that I know of because he could bow and he could play uh, pizzicato just beautifully. Uh, started around playing around Detroit and then a tenor saxophone called the Vice Prez, his name was Paul Kunishe, you know, played like Lester Young and uh, he took him to New York. Uh, Paul played with uh, Benny Green, uh, George Wallington, Don Bird, and then he joined Miles Davis Quintet, which in uh, 1955 with um, John Coltrane, Philly Joe, and Rick Garland did some of the finest recording. I think he was the most recorded bass player during the 50s and early part of the 60s. Anybody who wanted to um, come to New York, and especially Blue Nola Prestige Records, you, they would get Paul Chambers on bass. Uh, just a fine, uh, he's in the top five for me in terms of bass players. Now, most people don't know, this guy by the name was Wilbur Ware. He was out of Chicago. He was taught himself banjo and then he taught himself bass. Um, started playing string bass around Chicago, playing with Sun Ra and Adam Jamal. And then he came to New York and was one of Monk's favorite bass players. Um, played with Monk and some of the stuff he did with Monk and Art Blakey is just phenomenal. Uh, didn't record a lot, but just a few records he recorded. <coughs> When I got into jazz, I was a Paul Chambers fan, but when I heard Wilbur Ware, I put him right up there with Paul Chambers. He, he didn't do all the uh, pizzicato, but he was a very uh, inventive bass player. He played like a primitive person would play a bass, you know. Um, just had a different kind of concept in terms of his rhythm and everything. He did some recordings with uh, Lee Morgan and uh, J.R. Montrose Monk. But, uh, Great bass player. He has one album called The Chicago Sound, which uh, consists of all the Chicago cats, Johnny Griffin, and Junior Mans, and uh, John Jenkins. But uh, like I said, one of the great bass players. Did not a lot of recording, but uh, the stuff he did. I had an opportunity to play with him one time in New York City at a jam session. This is Doug Watkins, Douglas Watkins out of Detroit. He was a cousin of Paul Chambers. Um, played around Detroit. Came to New York and joined Art Blakey's Jazz Messenger. He's one of the founding members. He, he along with Horace Silver, Kenny Dorham, and Hank Mobley, they were the founding members of the Jazz Messengers. Um, just had a concept somewhat like Percy Heath. He, he, whenever you had Doug Watkins on the set, you knew the bass was taken care of. He had that um, just a, a bluesy kind of concept. He was on uh, Horace Silver's Senor Blues, um, uh, another one called Fuego, uh, Donald Bird, and which had complicated bass lines. This cat could really play their bass lines. Um, one of my favorite bass players. He died coming to California. He was on a gig coming out here to the workshop with uh, Elmo Hope and Philly Joe and um, Somebody went to sleep behind the wheel. He was the only one killed in a car crash. Um, I think it was 27 years old at that time. This is Sam Jones out of Florida. Uh, played around and when he came to New York, he started working with many Kenny Durham, Bobby Timmons, uh, Jazz Prophets. And then he joined Cannonball Avenue's group. And that was just, he along with uh, Lewis Hayes, I mean, they had a 
tight knit rhythm section. Uh, he was out at Ray Brown School. Uh, the bass player was just there for you, locked in. Um, Sam Jones. He recorded for Riverside Records, did a lot of stuff. And uh, after he left Cannonball, he joined Oscar Peterson. Uh, he took Ray Brown's place with Oscar Peterson. And to play with Oscar Peterson, you had to be one of the top cats in the land. That's because Oscar Peterson was one of the uh, most sought after piano players during the 50s, 60s, and 70s. <laughs> okay, last one. Uh, Jimmy Jones, Jimmy Jones, Jimmy Jones, Jimmy Jones. This is Ron Carter out of uh, South Michigan, Detroit. Came to, uh, went to Wayne State University, studied. Uh, he went to Cass Tech also, but he, he went as a cello player. And uh, and when he seen that uh, he wouldn't be able to get into the symphony playing cello, he switched over to bass and started playing bass. His first recordings were with Yusef Latif, and not as a bass player, but as a cello player. And, uh, he played with Yusef, and then he played around uh, New York, played with Eric Dolphy, Jackie Byard, different play people. And then he joined Miles Davis' second great quintet, they say, uh, with Tony Williams and Herbie Hancock, and stayed with them until Miles, um, then they left and uh, had formed a group called VSOP with Freddie Hubbard, Wayne Shorter, and Herbie, and, and Tony Williams. He's still, uh, still in New York doing it, and uh, one of the last of the great bass players. We have a cat who I think is uh, hair to all these guys. His name is Christian McBride, and uh, phenomenal. He's phenomenal. And what I know is a lot of these the younger bass players, a lot of them started off with an electric bass, and they able to incorporate some of them techniques from the electric bass onto the string bass, and they um, bring in a whole different sound of the mu music. And uh, Chris McBride is one of the one of the hairs of this whole legacy. Thank you. That's the string bass. <laughs> <laughs>